it's your boy king buzz back with those exclusives welcome to the channel where we make no excuses shout out all artists engineers and producers and i'm back with another video y'all know what's going on and today we got 15 times rappers have fought to leave a bad contract all right this is 15 different times but me and you know it's probably happened way more than this it's almost a everyday thing or we see at least two three artists go through it every calendar year all right but i got this article right here from um okplayer.com and i was just doing my daily browses and stuff online like i usually do uh i try to keep myself as informed as i possibly can be and i just like learning about as much as i can so as much as you can learn from a good contract you can learn just as much from a bad contract <laughs> you know what i mean so this is 15 times right so we're just gonna go down the list Chuck D versus Universal Records, right? Now, it says it right here, Public Enemy frontman Chuck D. If you don't know who Public Enemy is and Chuck D, you're probably too young. <laughs> and I'm only 23, but I'm just seasoned, you know what I mean? I, I've, I've had the pleasure of being around some hip hop heads my lifetime, you know what I mean? So anyways, but all right. So Chuck D struck back against the major label system in 2011. This is recent. This is recent. It's only nine years ago. You know what I mean? Suing Universal Records for a hundred million in unpaid royalties. So he wasn't getting his royalties. And we all know that this is common though. Like once you sign that deal, like right now you independent, you do, uh, you get, you be getting your streaming royalties and your ASCAP and all that, right? And you see those numbers and you see the money come in. But it's like, soon as you sign your line, I mean, soon as you sign on that dotted line, you don't see that anymore. You don't know what you're making anymore. You don't know nothing. The labels know everything. They have all the analytics and they kind of hold all that from you, right? They don't, they don't really be wanting you to know because they, they don't want you to know your worth. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't benefit, it doesn't benefit the label when the artists know their true worth. You know what I mean? It just doesn't. Uh, but okay. According to Chuck D Universal, which acquired the rights to Public Enemy's first five studio albums had only been paying the group 25% of the royalties owed from digital downloads. What? Bro 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 see see imagine 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 let's just say a hundred thousand dollars imagine you made a hundred thousand dollars right and you well you put out an album you made a hundred thousand you only got twenty five thousand right when you got that 25,000, you was probably happy. You know what I mean? Like I know if somebody handed me $25,000 right now, I'll be lit. I ain't gonna lie to you, I'll be lit. I'll be like, oh yeah, I need this, I need this. I could use this, you feel me? But at the same time, when you kind of find out that, wait, I only got 25 out of the 100 I was supposed to get. You know what I mean? That's like, I don't want to like bring family into it, but this is just example. That's like your mama leave you a hundred dollars, right? In the house. She leave it with your brother, right? And she say, uh, when such and such get home, give him this. And then when you get home, your brother get $25. Like, oh, mama left this for you. Right? Then you go out, you chilling, you like, all right, whatever, cool. And then you get home and your mama like, uh, did you get that hundred I left for you? And you like, you only gave me 25. You know what I mean? Like, ain't no way, bro. <laughs> you only paid me 25%? Like, nah, bro. Um, 
down the, the suit which cited a case in which Eminem's lawyer argued that digital sales should yield a higher payment than that of a standard royalty on the grounds that online agreements double as licensing deals, argued that public enemies should receive 50% of net revenue from their digital sales instead of the 18% they had been receiving up until that point. Like the brand, the label, labels, main job is to retain as much revenue as they can for themselves so they're trying to pay you as least as possible that's why every time you do something you go to the studio oh yeah we pay for it or photo shoot we pay for it uh your hotel we pay for it your uh traveling we'll pay for it they they're gonna tell you they're gonna pay for everything so then when the back end comes, when that money hit, they're gonna be like, oh, no, I remember we did this. Remember we did that? You know what I mean? Like, growing up, I always hated the people who brung up with what they did for you. Like, when it was time, you know, to do something, they'd be like, remember when I? And that's what major labels are, bro. That's what record labels are, bro. They, they are the people who come back around and they be like, Remember what I did for you? Remember when I did that? Remember when? Remember when? And it's like, mm, we're not talking about that. What about right now? You know what I mean? Um, so look, Chuck D, Lil Wayne, we all remember this. It was not too long ago. Uh, after rumors of tension between the two bubbled to surface in 2014, Lil Wayne filed a $51 million lawsuit against Birdman and cash money accusing the ceo of violating the terms of his contract by withholding his 12th solo studio 12th solo studio album the carter five y'all all remember this we all remember this not that long ago it actually was kind of long ago but it wasn't that long ago it was only six years ago uh but music just moves so fast that the shortest period of time seems like forever uh but yeah we we all know how that went down Wayne ends up getting out of the contract. Now he's signed directly to UMG, um, him and Drake. And, you know, he got to take his label with him. So the whole Young Money. And, yeah, it's just crazy, though. Like, it's crazy the history that they had and how they came up together. Like, Wayne was with Cash Money his entire career, bro. His entire career. Bro, he was with them since he was like yay high to a horse fly. You feel me? And we all know that. And at the end of the day, business is business. And when money is part of the equation, that's it always going to get a little tricky, bro. Because, hey, people want to withhold as much money as they possibly can, bro. And that's just what it is. I ain't even gonna, I'm not gonna read through everything, but y'all know, man. Y'all know how it go. Uh, Lil Uzi. This was not too long ago either. All right, so I don't remember exactly what happened, so let's read this. Lil Uzi Vert's issues with his record label, Generation Now, have been well documented with the superstar having voiced his frustration on multiple occasions, signing a deal with the label in 2015, a Philly native shot to start on with the release of his breakout mixtape Lil Uzi Vert versus the world in 2016. Wait, that's when Lil Uzi first popped in 2016? This is what I mean by like the shortest period of time seems so long in music because I feel like Uzi been out for a while now. But it really haven't been that long. That's crazy. Uh, but caused controversy with his announcement that he had signed a deal with Wiz, Khalif, Wiz Khalifa's Teller Gang imprint, a claim that was later debunked by Generation Now founder DJ Drama. Oh, DJ Drama's Generation Now? I did not know that. Uh, via a post on Twitter later that same year, Uzi Vert revealed that his debut, Love Is Rage 2, was completed. However, the album wouldn't materialize until August 2017, with the rapper placing blame for the project's delay on his handlers. So basically they was holding his project. You know, same thing that we hear all the time. They was holding out on his project. 
Uzi continued to air his grievances via Twitter warning artists not to sign a deal with, with a subsidi subsidiary. I don't know why I just stumbled on that word like that, but uh, a subsidiary DJ or another artist. It was not subtle shot at DJ drama and generation now in December, 2018, he continued to allude to his friction with generation now on Shabazz TBG cut shells, which included bars about getting out of his record deal and possibly taking a sabbatical from music. Sabbatical means he's take a break. If y'all don't know, he was, you know, he wanted to take a break. Uh, Uzi appeared to back up those claims in January 2019, announcing his retirement from music later, attributing his decisions to the bad blood between him and his label on Instagram Live. All right. And then y'all know how it went down. And I think eventually Rock Nation stepped in. Yeah, here it is right now. Uzi officially inked the management deal Rock Nation, who had thanked early in the week for arranging studio time for him and released a new song titled Free Uzi following day the song, which was removed from all streaming platforms, also came with mid claims that Uzi's sophomore album, Eternal Take, was complete, but its release was being blocked by the label. A charge DJ Drama denied in late March. TMZ reported Uzi's desire to renegotiate his contract due to feeling financially and artistically exploited by Generation Now, a request the label reportedly denied. And labels always just deny everything. It's not us. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. Da, 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 da. Snoop Dogg versus Death Row. Now, if y'all don't know, Death Row was apparently taking about 300K out of Snoop Dogg pocket a month. They were giving him like 50K a month. But they should have been giving him like 300K. But at the time he was fighting a charge and they were helping with his legal fees. So he didn't really care. But later on he realized, yo, I was getting robbed. <laughs> so let's just read a little bit of it. Inking a deal with Death Row Records in 1992, Snoop Dogg became one of the biggest artists in the music. With his, <clears throat> with his 1993 debut, I said debut, well, I say it like that, debut, Doggy Style, but by 1997, he was disillusioned with the label following departure of Dr. Dre, the death of Tupac Shakur, and the incarceration of CEO Suge Knight. To make matters worse, <clears throat> the rapper had also begun begun to publicly denounce Death Row, accusing the label of withholding payments and cheating him of his song publishing rights. Things came to a head in early 1998 with the release of Death Row Killer, a song aimed at the label and its principal members, as well as various media reports surrounding Snoop's pending departure from the label. <clears throat> in March that year, Master P, with whom Snoop had collaborated with in 1997, came to the rescue negotiating with Suge Knight personally and extended an offer Knight couldn't refuse, which we did that deal. People don't know Suge was in prison at the time P recalled during an episode of Drink Champs. I went to go visit him in prison. He had some deals for Snoop on the table. You know me, I'm a country boy. I'm like, how much money are they gonna give you? He told me the number. I said, well, I'm gonna give you 300,000 more than whatever's the deal they got on the table. And that's what we did. <clears throat> Hey man, they're talking big dollars. All right, Cameron versus Epic Records. See, I was young. I don't even remember. I was born in 97, just so y'all know. Bro. I was born in 97. This stuff was going on, and I was a little baby. You feel me? Uh, so Cam, Cameron, discovered by Notorious B.I.G. and signed to Entertainment records in 1990 i've never heard entertainment i've never heard of that in 1997 cameron's career got off to a hot start the rapper's debut album confessions of fire went gold the following year however when entertainment ceo lane on rivera lane on rivera lost his distribution deal with epic the harlem rapper contract 
was absorbed by the label, which had a lackluster track record for prom of promoting and marketing rap acts. Unsatisfied with the rollout of his sophomore album, SDE, Cameron began a campaign to get himself out of his contract with Epic, creating a hostile environment in the label's offices and taking on a Dame, taking on Dame Dash as a manager who convinced Epic that it wasn't worth the trouble to keep Cameron on the roster. That was crazy. I did not know that Biggie discovered Cameron. That's, that's, that's crazy. I didn't, I really did not know that. See, this is why I like, this is why you gotta read, man. You learn stuff. That's the whole point of reading. The clips versus job records. I see this stuff. I was a I was a little kid. I was a little kid. I had no clue that this stuff happened or was going on. Um, like the ones that just happened, like you know, in the last ten years, I'm aware of. But everything, you know, probably like twenty years and back, or like fifteen years and back, I'm not that aware. I was young. Uh, so the clips gaining the attention of the rap world with their 2002 debut lord willing the clips were prom to release one of the most anticipated sophomore rap albums in the history before contractual limbo got in the duo's way in 2004 when <clears throat> arista records merged job records the clips who were signed to arista through star trek wound up at job a label notorious for it's lack of success promoting rap acts. We're starting to see a pattern right here. A lot of these labels have lack luster success in promoting rap acts. And it's just funny because today hip hop is like the number one genre. So now if you're a label and you lack in promoting rap acts, your label literally is like non-existent. Um... As, frustrated, as frustration mounted in the face of multiple album delays for their sophomore album, Hell Half No Fury, Pusha T and No Malice filed a lawsuit against Job seeking a release from the label, citing a lack of promotion. While Job balked, the two sides reached a settlement in 2006, which should include a distribution deal for the clips, re-up gang imprint, Hell Half No Fury, was released in November 2006 to rave reviews, but was deemed a commercial failure. In comparison to their previous effort, less than a year after its release, the duo departed from Jive, inking a five year deal, 50 50 profit sharing arrangement with Columbia for Re Up Gang Records in October 2007. But that was a boss move. Um, it doesn't seem like they really got um, screwed out of <clears throat> any money or anything. They just was in a bad position where two labels merged and the label that really took control didn't care about them. Um, and that happens a lot. Lupe fiasco. And what happened to Lupe? Coming off of two critically acclaimed releases, Food and Liquor and The Cool, Lupe fiasco embarked on an extended run on the road while recording tracks for his third studio album. However, the first signs of trouble brewing between Lupe and his record label Atlantic Records. He was at Atlantic Records. I mean, yeah, it says it right here. <laughs> Occurred in 2008 when he announced his plans to retire from music after releasing a triple disc album titled Loop. What was it? Loop End? Loop End? He, then he used to say loop in the third loop in the third I think it's loop in I don't know bro uh with three albums remaining on his recording contract the move would have fulfilled his contractual obligations to Atlantic Records allowing him to pursue opportunities elsewhere fiasco and Atlantic Records I mean fiasco and Atlantic's differing opinions on musical direction of his next project for the label created a rift between the parties as did the label's alleged attempt to force the rapper into a 360 deal so basically they didn't agree he wanted they didn't want him to make the type of music that he wanted to make 
and then they try to force them into a 360 deal and a 360 deal is when your label literally profits off of every single thing you do you know what i mean like when you sign a regular deal that's not a 360 they profit off of your music when you sign a 360 deal you go out you create merch oh let me get a percentage of that you go on tour let me get a percentage of that tour money you do this let me get a percentage of that they want a percentage of everything you everything your name is tied to because they help build your brand you know what i mean uh so 360 deals are the thing but yeah don't sign a 360 deal this is why you gotta grind and you gotta build your catalog and you gotta uh, build your core fan base before you seek out a label and in my opinion you really shouldn't seek out a label at all man like forget these labels but if you have leverage you can really finesse a label russ is a great example you know what i mean like you can really finesse a label you know what i mean uh joe budden and def jam we all have heard a thousand times about what happened to joe budden he he talk about it all the time um but let's just get into it upon signing with def jam records in 2002 joe budden was touted as a future cornerstone of the label less than five years later after releasing the gold certified self-titled debut album and earning a grammy nomination the new jersey rap i mean the new jersey rep was unceremoniously jettisoned leaving him a f man yo when y'all niggas be writing bro hold up bro, bro. i am a great reiner I mean, I'm a great reader. I am a great reader. But people be talking about me using big words. They use unnecessary words. Unceremonious. I said it right. Unceremoniously. Jet but they put... All right. So basically, unceremoniously jettisoned. He was dropped. That's all it means. He got dropped. Leaving him a free agent in the prime years of his career... The rift between Budden and the label began during the recording of his intended sophomore album, The Growth, which was rejected by Def Jam. So, they didn't like what Joe was creating. And they wanted him to make a certain type of music. Like, Pump It Up, I guess. That was, like, his most commercial hit. And Joe just wanted to rap, bro. He like, let me rap. Azalea Banks and Universal... Uh, this video is getting kind of lengthy. Uh, but Azalea Banks and Univers Universal. Uh, Azalea Banks' will willingness to wage war against enemies, big or small, has become a part of her allure. But one battle that may have flew under the radar was the one sided affair between the rapper and her parent record company, Universal Records. The Holland rapper, whose debut album broke with expensive taste, was initially slated to drop in fall 2012, began putting the pressure on the label in 2013. During a social media tirade aimed largely at Pharrell Williams' lack of assistance for their collaboration, ATM Jam. <clears throat> However, in January the following year, Banks went to social media and asked to be released or bought out from her contract with Universal, blaming the label of being out of touch with her core audience. Universal ultimately obliged dropping her from the label in October 2014, with the rapper eventually releasing broke with expensive taste independent independently weeks later with khalifa and rostrum records yo this should tell you something bro when you just go down the list and it's just name after name after name after name after name after name, after name. like bro these labels man these labels and it, it's it's from the major labels to the small labels trying to come up all of them, bro. They all be doing shady business. Like, I ain't even know about this Wiz one. Uh, Wiz Khalifa filed a lawsuit against former management Benji Grindberg of Rostrum Records in an attempt to avoid his 360 recording contract with the label. Khalifa, who signed to his roster at 16 years old, sought $1 million in punitive, I mean, punitive punitive damages and legal fees from Grinberg 
The suit also argued that Khalifa's agreement with Rostrum could be terminated under California's seven-year labor code. Greenberg, whose tenure <clears throat> as Khalifa's personal manager ended in March 2014, and Rostrum fired back with a countersuit seeking $2 million worth of unpaid fees from their existing deal and 15% of rappers touring and music royalties. However, in January 2017, both parties reached a settlement out of court which they announced in a joint statement. Mace and Bad Boy. Now we all know, we all know Diddy. <clears throat> we all know this man Diddy. Diddy was known for bad deals, bro. Like, we ain't even gotta get into this. Like, Diddy was known for bad deals. Remember they said, I think they said 50 Cent went to Diddy office <laughs> with his gun. Like, you ain't about to play me. Cause Diddy was trying to sign 50 before 50 ended up with him and Dre. But yeah. Uh but I'ma put the article down in the description and y'all can come and look and read up on all these if you want to. Um but yeah. Twister versus creators way associated like, like bro There's so many artists that went through it early all Twister found himself entangled in a legal battle with former collaborator and co-ceo of Qual records legendary track star track star who had inked Twister to a record deal through big beat Slash Atlanta records during the mid 90s filed a lawsuit against the Chicago rapper for copyright infringement in a response to Twister violating the terms of their agreement by releasing unauthorized music through his own legit balling imprint, filing for bankruptcy in an attempt to get out of delivering the five remaining albums on his contract. With Qual, Twister was facing $150,000 in damages, court costs, and legal fees. Twister, track star, and Atlantic will ultimately reach a settlement, opening the door for Twister to sign a multi million deal with Atlantic, releasing his breakthrough album, Kamikaze, in 2004. See, that's crazy. I was I was a kid, so I really didn't know nothing about that. That's wild. The locks and bad boy, like I said, like I said, bro, Diddy was known for bad deals, bro. It's just the facts, bro. Diddy's a great businessman, but he was known for bad deals. Like Diddy is gonna get his money no matter what, and that's just what it is. Like I don't even want to read it. I just know. Dr. Dre and Ruthless Records. Come on, man. Y'all ain't seen the whole N.W.A. movie. Y'all know how it went down. Um, Jerry Heller. You know what I mean? Easy e was getting paid, but nobody else was really getting no money like that. I don't even think Easy e was really getting money like he's, he was supposed to. You know what I mean? But, uh, De La Soul versus Tommy Boy Records. One of the most tenuous spats between a rap act and a record label in recent years occurred in 2019. This is recent. Where was I, bro? I didn't even hear about this one. When De La Soul sparked a boycott of Tommy Boy Records amid a dispute over royalties. <clears throat> bro, what happened, bro? I'm just, I just want to skim through, bro. This video is already long. Uh... The current terms of their contract with Tommy Boy, the label will receive roughly 90% of the profits while De La will receive a mere 10%. Tommy Boy, which postponed the catalog's release, engaged in negotiations with the group, but the two sides were unable to reach an agreement, leading De La to publicly cut ties with the label in August 2019 after 30 years of profiting from our music and hard work. And after seven long months of stalled negotiations, we are sad to say that we've been unable to reach an agreement and earn Tommy Boy's respect from our music le legacy. De La Soul wrote in the Instagram post and it's in the split. That's crazy, bro. Even after you, like, even after you Put your blood, sweat, and tears into it. People still trying to like take advantage. And if you ain't learned nothing from this video, you should have learned. Don't trust these labels, man. 
don't trust nobody really man be be willing to sit through that process and wait it out and always weigh out all your options and if you are looking to sign to a label and for my family watching this bro i don't want to sign to a label i know like in y'all mind signing to a label means you made it in my mind it doesn't work like that i just i don't see it like that i don't see it like that at all but anyways what i was saying is if you do want to sign to a label make sure you have leverage you got to be able to play on a higher ground in them like if you walk in there you already got a nice following you got nice numbers and you looking at like what can y'all do for me and they not looking at you like you're a waste they're looking at you like you're a come up because you already have everything that they're looking for you already have something going you know what i mean so anyways the way i really feel man get all these labels i don't want to sign to a label i want to build my own and i want us to come up like that independent labels dream team all that good stuff you know what i mean but this is just 15 artists bro but there's hundreds and thousands of artists who went through bad deals bro it happens every day but we're gonna keep growing we're gonna keep going strong y'all know what's going on it's your boy king buzz and i'm out of here yeah.